to chuck in um, where you're tuning in from and what startup um, you're a part of if, if you're a part of a startup. Um, but otherwise, um, welcome to today's webinar. Um, today we've got John Davies from Insured HQ. Um, now he has over 20 years of experience um, in the States and with startups. Um, and it's gonna be talking a lot about how specifically to operate your SaaS through the pandemic. So obviously with Insured HQ over the past two years, um, he's had to do a lot of that remotely, um, almost completely remotely, I believe. Um, so there's a fair bit of insight um, that he will be able to give um, on that. Um, and just a quick um, shout out to our sponsors, BNZ, NZ Trading Enterprise, AWS, Avanda Management, Jasmine Investments, and K1W1 for supporting Territory3 and our Kiwi Founder community. Um, so welcome to John. Um, I'd love if you could give us a little bit of a quick background, um, you know, what you've done over the years and, and um, what you're up to at the moment. Yeah, well, um, thanks for hosting me and Kura, good morning, everyone. Um, my, my accent probably gives away that I was obviously raised in New Zealand. I grew up in Wellington, um, but I lived in the US for 20 years. It's, it's pretty much an extended OE. Um, so mainly based in the US, um, mainly living and working in the San Francisco Bay Area and Silicon Valley. Um, and I've worked in tech since the early 2000s. Um, and I arrived in Silicon Valley kind of at the end of the initial dot-com boom. So I'm really kind of dating myself here with, with those references. Um, but um, initially I was working in the outdoor industry. Um, that, that was my OE plan for getting to see the world. I used to plan and lead adventure travel trips globally. Uh, had a regional focus on um, trips through Alaska, British Columbia, the Pacific Northwest. Um, and was also uh, a member um, of the mountain search and rescue team for my local um, county sheriff's department. So I was a, a card carrying sheriff, sheriff for a while. And, and in these roles, um, I always knew the technology, the computer, the web stuff, um, how, to, how to design the website and, and get enrollments um, better than anyone else. Um, full disclosure, my dad was a computer engineer, so I'm kind of second generation. Um, but I, I reached this glass ceiling pretty fast in the industry, but they're all pretty small operators. You can only get so far before you become an owner operator. Um, and also it doesn't really pay very well. So I, I needed to pay a mortgage and by serendipity met a guy who wanted to start a new business, um, supporting and providing technology services to startups and SMBs in the Bay Area. Um, and this is all, again, um, dating myself. This is all before infrastructure as a service became an acronym. Uh, before SaaS was really mainstream, um, and certainly the SaaS metrics were not around, um, you know, but, but Salesforce and all the early SaaS was on the rise. Um, and so starting this business was a serious lesson and, um, you know, kind of timing and luck. We, we aced it. I didn't know anything, but, um, but we really aced the timing because it was, it was um, kind of as GFC hit. Um, so people were looking to outsource um, and save costs. And, and move to an OPEX budget rather than a CAPEX budget. Um, and then SaaS and Web 2.0 were really starting to emerge. So San Francisco and the Bay Area were really starting to grow in terms of these small startups that were growing fast and needed a lot of help. Um, and this was also, um, again, dating myself, before public clouds such as uh, AWS and Azure and GCP was really a thing. So this is what we do. Um, what we did, and this is the services we provide. So we provided infrastructure services to startups. Grew like crazy. Um, we made the Inc. 500 for two years in a row. Um, and it's the, um, the Inc. 500 is the fastest um, growing companies in the US. Uh, it's the top 500. And so we made that two years in a row. Um, uh, again, it's like it's much easier to make that list during a recession when everyone else is doing poorly and, and we're leveraging the recession to our advantage. Um, and then, you know, the other interesting part is even though SAS metrics, the modern SAS metrics were not standardized, you know, like they are today, thanks to, you know, people like David Scott, um, you know, that didn't really happen until the 2010s. We were still focusing on, on you know, kind of much of those standard SAS metrics that we know in terms of today, like CAC and churn and LTV and margin and cross-sell and upsell. Um, but, but our view on these metrics came from, you know, in, in terms of margin, how can we optimize the team efficiency, the back office admin, the marketing, the advertising, 
um, you know, one of our, our um, kind of North Star metrics, and I can talk about kind of how I think about that in Insurance Q2, we were focused on revenue per employee because efficiencies were the key. Um, uh, and, you know, many of these operational efficiencies that we all focused on, they all, all of them have SaaS offerings today. You know, in, in hindsight, we probably blew about 15 opportunities to build another SaaS company with, in terms of what we're doing and, and automating and, and um, building in-house. Um, but back, because back then there was nothing. Um, you know, and again, I, like, I make it sound like it was eons ago. It was only, um, you know, kind of 12 years ago, but I guess it's like dog years, right? It's like one year in SaaS is like seven years <laughs> in any other industry. Um, and a lot of our view on metrics really came down to um, kind of, we were bootstrapped. So it came down to uh, gut inst instincts on, on how to survive. Um, and we were just, you know, figuring it all out on the fly. We were learning lessons. We were screwing up royally, but we were just, you know, I think we were tenacious and, and just really curious. So we're, you know, asking these questions um, such as, you know, what's going on in this sales cycle? Why is it taking so long? Um, what are the things we could do to make it work better or add value? Um, you know, how the heck do we automate marketing? Um, you know, because HubSpot certainly wasn't a thing back then. Um, uh, and <laughs> we, we were doing crazy things. So, so back then um, in the Bay Area, there was this website called Craigslist. Um, it was like the way you can um, sell yourself and market yourself. And whenever you had to list an advert, you had to fill in this capture. Um, you know, so we were paying a guy in the Ukraine to hack the capture so we could automatically post. So we had these automatic posts going out all the time in these different regions, targeting different kind of problems that these companies may have. Um, and we got amazing amount of leads through that. Um, once we started to grow bigger, we really started amping up our customer referral engine and we would start, you know, um, paying our customers for referrals where it's like, hey, the first three months of revenue uh, are yours. You get to decide whether you want a cash payment, you want to take us, us to take you out to dinner or whether you want a credit for, you know, your recurring uh, revenue payment. Um, and we even had to build our own uh, ticketing and support service that we called uh, Hub. Um, you know, that's now Jira or ServiceNow, you know, because they were not a thing yet. Um, but it really enabled us to do so many automations that really made us um, uh, capital and administratively efficient. Um, and we even did stuff like uh, we played around with landing pages, you know, before you could design your own landing pages with, you know, whatever the apps are today. Um, and we were stalking our visitors, you know, so we could capture all of the IP addresses of, of site visitors. And then we would manually reverse look up that IP address to see which business had registered that IP address, stalk the kind of C-suite people in that, in that um, business, and then call them and say, hey, I see you're looking at our website. Um, it would freak them out, but, you know, it's part of the sales cycle. It's like, yeah, we're this good that we know who you are. Um, but anyway, the, the business did well. And again, this was early web 2.0 um, and, um, and before the public cloud went really mainstream. And, and we were working with lots of kind of plenty of tech startups. And um, we were working with Yammer, uh, with Nest, you know, the um, security webcams that Google now owns um, and SolarCity, um, which is now Tesla, owned by Tesla, uh, all of their Tesla solar stuff. Um, so that's where I cut my teeth. So running a startup and supporting other startups. And you know, in, in hindsight, it was some of the coolest business years of my life, even though it was just stressful and hard work. Uh, and from there, uh, Yammer were pushing me hard to join them as their full-time head of architecture. But I ended up starting a consultancy with a friend, which was design thinking based, focused on um, systems design. And we started consulting with some pretty big hitters, uh, Microsoft, NASA, Nike, Mozilla. Um, and I was running a um, kind of innovation accelerator um, for NASA and Nike. Um, so again, back into the startup world, early stage, um, running an accelerator um, for them. From there, um, I, I spent five years working for New Zealand Trade Enterprise. Uh, I joined the advisory board at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. Um, so lots and lots and lots of startups from New Zealand looking to enter the US market. Um, and then lots of, um, we have our own accelerator at the NASDAQ um, and lots and lots of companies coming through in the accelerator program um, where I'm still there today. So I'm still having an advisory session <laughs> later today. I don't know, actually tomorrow morning for uh, someone in that accelerator. 
so that that's kind of where I got. And um, it's probably best now to go into a little bit more about Insured HQ. Um, so Insured HQ is a, a, a software platform originally um, targeted at providing software to micro insurance, uh, micro insurers in developing nations. Um, so they wanted to bring all of the software available at the, the high end of town into kind of developing um, countries and micro insurers. Um, the problem with that is um, there's a market there. There's just not a compelling business model. Um, and so InsureHQ decided that they needed to pivot and target towards um, more mid-market insurers and organizations um, who, who we discovered really face identical business challenges as the initial microinsurance markets. Um, and as part of that um, transition, they conducted a search for someone who could help the business get to the next stage, which is where I came in. So I started this role two and a half years ago. I moved back to New Zealand at the end of 2019 in December. And at the time, you know, my assumption was I'd be spending a bunch of time um, flying back and forth between Australia, the US and New Zealand. Um, you know, and, and in reality, I aced the timing of moving back to New Zealand as the, you know, the pandemic just crushed the US at the time. Um, but it's also, you know, created a really interesting dynamic for me personally, because, um, you know, there's, there's 18 staff that work for InsureHQ, and I've only ever met two people in person. Um, the last time I worked in the insurance industry was when I was doing kind of a part-time um, data entry job at university, um, dating myself again in the early 90s, uh, mid 90s. And then the last time I set foot in Australia was um, in the late 90s. So, you know, if our target market is um, insurance organizations in Australia, uh, and because we're in a pandemic and we can't travel for conference or for pre-sales, um, what's the best strategy? Because, you know, I've not been there for over 20 years. Um, so, you know, it's, it's starting off this job of trying to figure out how the hell do I make impact when it's no longer business as usual? Um, and so, you know, if it's, it freaks me out, you know, when you think about these bigger things. And so what's helpful for me is I, I have these mental models that I use um, and they're basically to stop me from getting completely overwhelmed. Um, I just like to compartmentalize the problems, challenges and barriers that I need to figure out how to scale up to the next stage. It's part of the, the kind of skill sets I managed to learn um, with the design thinking agency that we had. And so um, because it's design thinking, I also think in alliterations, right? So, um, a lot of my thinking is alliterative. So what I want to think about is product, pricing, positioning, people, and process. Um, so those are the kind of the big P's um, uh, of how I started approach, you know, what the hell do I do during a, a pandemic? Um, but before all, all that starts, um, I always start to try and identify little constraints. Stop me at any time if I'm just talking too much. <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> Okay, um, yes, um, SaaS is, is a very, very noisy industry these days, and, and that also applies into the InsurTech business. Um, you know, in an InsurTech, if, if there was such a thing as a sexy side of InsurTech, we're on the opposite spectrum of that. Um, you know, we're core administration is what we do. Um, and, and these customers are busier, they have more options. Um, uh, and so it's, it's not really about, um, capturing their attention, even though that's important. I'll, I'll come back to that. But the other constraint is Insured HQ is not an, or, an, organization, an organization that's really flush with cash. Um, historically, the business had taken venture capital. Um, but men, you know, the, the, the model that we operate with today is we're a bootstrap business. Um, our key operating metric is going to be cash at hand. Um, and that constraint really dictates much of kind of how I design our current strategy. Um, we're also a small team, um, and so we have cross-discipline pods. We're very uh, developer-centric, uh, lots of developers in the team, um, and, and we have pods. So those pods cover support, product development, and implementation. All the pods cover all three pillars there, um, and so there's lots of cross-pollinization, but because we're also bootstrapped, we don't have a big budget for growth, and normally the big budget for growth gets spent on people. 
Um, the other constraint is we're on the enterprise side of SaaS, really large complex product, long sales cycle, long implementation cycles before we can go live and recognize that glorious recurring revenue. Um, and what all this means is we have a constraint actually on the number of customers we can take on in a year, purely based on capacity and quality. Um, and so what this means is that any pipeline, sales pipeline that we have has to be really high quality and, and well vetted. Um, so the summary of all this is, is where I got to about a year and a half ago was that in, in order for the business to scale, we need the growth economics ready for scale. And in order for the growth economics to be ready for scale, we needed the team to get ready to scale. And in order for the team to get ready to scale, we need to get the product ready for scale and, and also stop doing certain things in a team that just get in the way. Um, uh, any questions so far? <laughs> Uh, no, nope. nothing. <laughs> uh, no, nothing's come through in terms of the, um, the Q&A. Um, mm -hmm. no, that's, that's awesome so much. For, um, thanks so much for going into your background um, on that. Um, be curious yeah. to, I guess, um, dive in a bit more in terms of um, working remotely for the past two years and especially jumping into a role where you, you know, you can't even meet most of your team. Um, yeah. What kind of tools and, and how did you kind of navigate that? Um, in order to, you know, have everyone still working productively, even though there is that, that disconnect? Yeah, um, it's hard. Um, I'm not perfect at it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, work in progress. Um, but, you know, uh, um, of, of those staff that, that uh, work for InsureXQ now, and I've only met the two in person, this also includes co-founders. There's one co-founder I've not even met yet in person. Um, so we're, and, and we're also a pretty borderless organization. Um, and so we have, you know, team members in North Auckland and South Auckland, which, you know, they might as well be in two different countries during COVID. Um, Raglan, Australia, India, Bangladesh, and the Philippines. Um, and, and in India, we have a, a whole um, office. Uh, we have an Indian corporation. Uh, it's a, a large, that's our largest office. Um, so we've got lots of time zones, lots of languages, lots of religions, uh, and lots of public holidays. Um, so in, in terms of key tools, um, the big one that is all day, every day is Slack. Um, uh, we are masters of Slack and leveraging Slack. And so we, we design our, our channels are around and, you know, projects, uh, customers. Um, there's a little bit of sales channel, but mainly devs, QA. We have a water cooler channel where um, it's a requirement that all discussions in the water cooler are nothing to do with work. Um, it's all personal life. It's where we all hang out and just goof off. Um, we use Jira and Confluence. Those are our system of records of uh, kind of getting stuff done. Uh, we use Hubstaff in terms of um, recording people's hours and, and payroll. And then Zoom is massive and, and um, because we have multi-language, um, English is the core language that everyone uses um, in Slack. And so um, we have to use, people prefer to chat um, typing rather than talking because you know a lot of people, English is their second language. They're not as comfortable um, talking in English as they are chatting. And so the, the power of emojis cannot be uh, underestimated um, in terms of getting points across and, and tone and emotion across. Um, and then we also, um, a big tool that I think is um, really valuable to me is WISE.com. It used to be called TransferWISE, but now it's called WISE. So, so WISE helps me run payroll. Um, it helps me collect payments because we have customers all over the world. We can invoice them in local currency with local banking details. Um, and we're saving thousands of dollars, multiple days in terms of, uh, you know, payment to receipt. Uh, a year using wise.com over what we used to use, which was traditional New Zealand banks, which aren't, you know, that digitally progressive. Um, and then kind of underneath, there's another, <laughs> there's another P um, underneath that kind of people part, right, is uh, principles. So there's a bunch of operating principles that, that um, I try to enable throughout the team to give them kind of some buy-in, some autonomy in the time zone that they're in, and a, a way of working together while we're you know, a distributed um, team. Um, so, you know, it's um, best idea wins is one principle. 
ask questions all the bloody time. Um, don't mistake a clear view with a short distance. Um, always look to the process to figure things out. It's okay to fail. You've got to own that. Um, and you know, it's stuff like there's always a workaround. Like whenever we're stuck in a solution, we're like, okay, what are the workarounds? What are the alternatives? What are we looking at? Um, <clears throat> oh, there was one other thing to add. What was it? Because I got a few things of it. Later. Um, a question just comes I'll come from, back to it. Um, from Lisa. Um, being an entrepreneur with no tech background, what advice can you give to us novices on how to know or learn about the process of working with the best suited developer? Um, you, so, um, I don't know. I don't, I, um, we have, when we're, when we're hiring developers, um, hiring a developer is really hard. Uh, we can't afford to do it in New Zealand, to be honest. Um, and the quality that we get, um, through the people we, we used to be able to find in India, um, is good. India is now, you know, very competitive. Um, the salaries over the last year or so have really increased probably a third to 50%. Um, and so sourcing them, right, kind of like pre-sales, like that channel of finding good developers uh, has been hard. Um, we've done our own searches. We've used recruiting companies. Um, recruiting companies have worked out better for us than doing our own search. Referrals work the best, um, similar to sales. Um, um, and then uh, we have a whole testing regime underneath that too. So, you know, looking at their resume, putting them in, into the test, um, seeing what they, what they churn out in terms of uh, the exam. And we have front-end and back-end developers. Um, so it's, you know, is it a front-end, is it a back-end, is it a full-stack test? Um, I have a preference of either full stack or, or I mean, a, a front end or back end, not full stack, just because of quality. Um, and that's kind of that's kind of it in terms of our playbook. We don't hire a lot of developers because we don't have a high amount of turnover, and our team is, is pretty small. Um, in the last two years, we've probably hired half a dozen, less than half a dozen. John, just a question. Do you see the um the Q and A box? Um, I'm just feeling like like I'm feeling super sick oh, yeah. right now. Um, oh no! I feel like I need it. I need to jump off because I'm just like kind of shaking yeah. and going on hold. Go, um, go, go jump off. I'll hold down the fort. Yeah. Can you? Yeah. Some. Sorry. I think because I've just made you host. Um, and then if I just like <laughs> mute and turn off my video. Um, and sorry. Okay. I'm gonna. Okay. Go. Um, uh, question from, um, Robert Owen, what things about, um, things about team get in the way? Robert, you're going to have to re-ask that question. I don't quite understand. It. <laughs> um, easy. What was the payment tool? Uh, wise.com is the one that we use, um, for payments. Um, and that is kind of, we can invoice through zero, um, and we have country-based invoices. Um, that, that can then provide the local, whether it's, um, you know, we've got US dollars, we've got um, people paying in Curacao, uh, Australia, New Zealand, they can all deposit. Um, uh, and, and it also helps us run payroll. So we run our payroll in uh, the Philippines and in India through WISE, um, and we can process that actually through um, Hubstaff, which is our kind of uh, HR tool for, for managing staff. Um, so, uh, the, the other thing about, about people is, um, you know, because we have a constraint on, on kind of cash flow, um, we really have to look at the product um, and, and look at the people for getting them out of the way um, of us being able to scale. And so what we wanted to do is, is I'm not sure if, if there's a lot of kind of, um, enterprise-based SaaS companies on the call. We're an enterprise SaaS company. Um, a lot of our revenue, because we're bootstrapped, comes from uh, our implementation fees. 
So, you know, full transparency here, we're about a 60-40 split at the moment of 60% uh, SaaS, 40% implementation uh, revenue. Uh, you know, that implementation revenue when it comes to valuation has been nothing because it's, you know, forward multiple of one or two. Um, but because we're a cash at hand business, it's a critical metric for us as, a, as an organization. But what we want to do now in order to start scaling up um, we really need to decelerate our, our implementation line um, on, on our PL. Um, and then start accelerating the recurring revenue side. Because by decelerating our implementation costs, we can reduce pressures on our, our small but still growing team um, and then get them to focus on things that can to happen on the job that really matter for scale. That would be you know, improving the UX adding new features, providing new integrations. And because we're going from kind of micro-insurance into this mid-market play for insurers, very enterprisey um, security, right? So passing that security order as part of the sales cycle, um, the better we're able to address that quickly and early on in the sales cycle takes out a ton of friction uh, in that sales cycle. And then um, the other thing I want to add on in, in terms of that is, um, when I think about using and leveraging um, the people at hand in order to get stuff done on behalf of the business, there's kind of like this operating triangle um, that I have, and it's called, um, uh, I call it pirate shepherds and shippers. And so when we need to do something that's pretty big, um, I'm looking at, you know, okay, in order to get this stuff done, we've got the pirates, they're gonna kind of uh, slash through, all of the muck and, and, and show the way forward. Um, in our case, you know, our um, kind of product architect does a lot of that in terms of the visionary um, background that they have in insurance and building the platform. Uh, then we have the shepherds. Uh, the shepherds are the people, it could be salespeople, uh, it, it could be um, our um, uh, head of engineering. They're gonna bring all the people along with the vision. Um, and then we have all of the Sherpas and that's going to be people doing all of the heavy lifting. And so you can be, you know, you're not, you're not going to be just one of those kind of archetypes, but um, you could be more than one, but in, in, I certainly am, but in terms of, you know, trying to get stuff done with an, with an organization, with people, with constraints, those are the kind of working frameworks that I have. Um, Let's look at the question some more. How, uh, from Nigel, how has your target market changed during the pandemic and also your competition? Um, any reaction to the panic from the older, more established vendors? Um, and how do you see the market unfolding now that remote everything is the new normal? That's an awesome question. Um, we, um, you know, initially what I envisioned was because I know the US so well, we already have customers in the US. I would be going, um, flying to Australia, flying to the US, flying back to New Zealand. And that would be kind of like the sales loop where we would go and try and secure, secure new customers. We have cut the US off now as an intentional market. Now we'll still respond to inquiries. We'll, we'll still respond to any inbound inquiries that come our way from the US um, because it is so big and, and I, I just know how to sell there. Um, so by intent now, our target market is Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and so that's how our target market has changed. Um, the, one of the biggest things that happened to the industry during the pandemic, you know, it's, um, the insurance industry is, is a, a subset of the financial industry. And so um, it's not very technologically progressive. Uh, their renewal cycle on technology is very long. You know, it's seven to 10 year renewal cycle if, you, if they're lucky. Um, a lot of their systems are, you know, on servers, on-prem, with software installed on computers, within the network, within the office. Very old school thinking. So, so it's not necessarily the competition um, that changed, it's the market appetite that changed. And so all of a sudden, because their teams are now distributed, they had to go and source software that would help them work in more distributed ways really advantageous for us. Um, uh, the challenge that we're still trying to solve is, is digital transformation is just hard um, within that industry in general. Um, 
and and taking them on a on a on a digital transformation journey is something that um, I find uh, hard to solve. And so, so with that, um, you know, one of the constraints we had was you know these long sales cycles. So I I wanted to um, decrease time to close opportunities. It's one of the most impactful things I could do to scale the business. Um, I really want to spark the interest of our customers and get them leaning in. And then um, one of the biggest failures that I think we've had historically and, and even happened during my tenure is we didn't provide a time to value quickly enough for a lot of these projects. Um, and so we've, we've changed the process in the last kind of 12 to 18 months in terms of how we um, create a time to value for our customers and, and our opportunities. And we do that by a proof of concept process. So, so it, while we're changing the process, we also had to redesign the product because the product itself was getting in the way. Um, uh, and so um, we spent the last year and a well, two years really, redesigning the product to get it ready for scale um, in, in terms of applying it to the process. So um, the first thing I did when I started was to start understanding the product itself because I'm not from the insurance industry and how our customers use it. Um, because I think it's important that our business should be, be defined not really in terms of the product we offer, but, but I want it to be defined in terms of what our customers need the product for you know, for, for them, product tools may come and go, um, but the basic needs um, of the customer groups and their customers stick around. So, so the problem we have is that customers' products are very complex. Their channel to market are very complex. The insurance products that they're offering to their customers um, are very unique. And so um, really for an insurance company, <clears throat> they make their money by having a number of things, um, an efficient and competitive quoting and onboarding process, great customer service, um, good accounts management and efficient claims processing. The bottom two are kind of the debt side. Of it. <clears throat> so, so biggest problem for us was time to value and proving that need and we, we meet those criteria. Um, I don't know if anyone here has ever deployed Salesforce. Um, you know, you can't just buy a subscription to Salesforce and it works. It's a massive undertaking to configure it for how you need this CRM to work. It's a CRM platform, it's not a CRM. In short, HQ is kind of the same way. Um, it's a powerful platform, but it needs configuring specifically to the business and the products that they need to manage. And then, um, you know, I talked earlier about the stuff that we needed to get out of the way of doing. So we were designing and deploying all these um, front-end screens specific to the product and the channel. It's, it's super time-consuming, definitely not our core superpower. Um, InsureHQ knows core insurance administration um, and being a system as record is what we do incredibly well. And we, we wanna keep this our, our operational focus of excellence now and in the future. Uh, and so, we really want to start engaging with insurers and third party partners whose expertise is, is the purchase path. And so that's why I talked about the, the glamorous side of insurance, you know, of insurance and insure tech. I think that's the glamorous side, right? It's the, the, the consumer channel. It's all of the, um, you know, the nice web experiences that people can have. We don't want to have, we don't want to be part of that. It's not a, a, a core excellence. So in order to solve that problem, we spent the last two years building this, this big public facing API. Um, no one within the organization has experienced building an API before. Um, I certainly didn't. Um, so describing and defining these new APIs so we can give the specs to our customers and developers is a, is a new skill for me and the team. Um, and then secondarily on top of that, you, know, you can't just kind of build the API and expect people to just adopt it and love it. Um, sourcing partners and customers with the appetite and, and, and the capability to, to build these compelling front-end experiences on top of our insured HQ API uh, is also required, as is also having real-world demonstrable examples of, of you know, kind of a well-architected front-end experience that integrates with 
our API core engine. All of this is a work in progress. Um, um, we have some serious validation with it because our hypothesis is that this new method of selling and partnering will really increase the sales cycle, limit insured HQ as being the bottleneck, which can in turn kind of unlock these speed and validation of new products and un unlock new markets for our insurers, our customers, kind of ahead of the, the competition. Um, with that, um, at, at Yammer, um, I built their first public cloud experience. So I built this kind of big SharePoint um, SQL um, farm for them so they could build their um, uh, Yammer app on a .NET instance. Um, you know, that was many moons ago. So, uh, and that was when AWS was two things, right? It was private cloud and public cloud. And um, AWS, you know, since then has now evolved into being this product of hundreds and hundreds of things. Um, and we use AWS. Um, and what I've really done now is, is lean hard into that AWS partnership. So I don't know if anyone um, is on AWS now. If, if you want to ping me, I can give you some sound advice of ways to engage with them that can be beneficial. They're awesome. Um, I'll be doing a webinar with them um, next month on some of, the, some of the things that we're leveraging uh, with AWS that unlocks opportunity with us and for our customers. Um, so really leaning into that partner network for, for us has been beneficial um, in terms of our products and our people, because we then get to leverage um, uh, resources within AWS that don't really cost as much. Um, so I'm going back to questions again. Um, after bootstrapping for seven years and now completing my first capital raise, how can I start building a team? Um, would it be best to have my first hires be in New Zealand? If they are international, how do I hire with confidence that they will be that, that they will stay part of the team? Um, that's from Jesse. So Jesse, um, I was very lucky. Uh, we have an, a, a we have a, a core office uh, in India. We have um, a husband who is the kind of uh, office manager and um, uh, kind of um, project manager does all the resourcing and his wife is the the head of um, development senior developer and so that that team combo there um, if we didn't have that it would be a lot harder for me to manage this distributed team um, so if you don't have those core people in an offshore organization I think it's going to be quite hard um, and so what you want to do is then start looking at, at the team, um, starting with what your core superpowers are. You know, I, I, can, I can manage sales, I can manage platform engineering. Um, I can't, you know, do anything with code. I, I'm not very good at pre-sales. So I need people to help there. So what are the gaps? Um, if you want to start hiring international, um, what, what InsureHQ did really well is start from a contracting perspective. So all of our key hires have been from Upwork. And so we've hired on Upwork, really liked the work, engaged with them more, and eventually they became employees. Um, not necessarily a hack that can work for everyone, but it's what, something that's worked for us multiple times. Um, Question from Steve Shepard, what are you using for drip email marketing? Um, we um, are, so here, we've tried um, email campaigns, cold outreach. Uh, we use HubSpot for our email marketing. We've tried LinkedIn marketing. Um, LinkedIn is, um, here's, here's a, a lesson for me learned is, Coming from the US, LinkedIn was something that was worked really well. Um, in Australia and New Zealand, no one uses LinkedIn. And so we, we did a, a few tests on, on LinkedIn advertising. It was a great success in the US and an absolute miserable failure in Australia and New Zealand. We had, you know, I don't know how many impressions that we had for our campaigns. Uh, thousands, and we had like six clicks in New Zealand. We had 12 clicks in Australia, but we had hundreds of clicks in, in the US. Um, uh, 
email campaigns don't work well if you don't have a warm intro because of the, there's in Australia there's probably 120 customers that, uh, opportunities that could become customers for us. Um, so we're, we're in a unique situation where we know um, who the majority of our potential customers could be in our target market. Um, and what we've done is, you know, looked at who our customers currently are. Um, and, and with our customers, look at where they get the most value in terms of um, uh, organizations. And so we've identified certain organizations um, within our key kind of target market, which has a list of all the other opportunities that we may have. So, so what we do is we have a very um, well-maintained database of potential customers. And we can start targeting them because we know who they are as a few hundred people. Um, question from Mike McMinn. Am um, I seeing a recovery yet post-COVID? Um, yep, yep, yep. So um, the biggest change that I've seen in the last two to three months is the return to in-market, uh, in, in-person activities. Um, you know, I think in-market and in-person activities are going to be something um, I'm going to have to mentally change my model to start doing again. <laughs> um, even in Auckland, you know, where um, I'm a member of InsureTech New Zealand, we're also a member of InsureTech Australia. Um, our our in-person um, meetups for InsureTech New Zealand haven't happened in a long, long time. Um, but I'm sure they're all going to be starting to happen too soon. And, and in InsureTech Australia, they're having meetups all the time now in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane. Um, do you have any tips for managing your culture remotely? How do you make your devs in India feel connected with you guys in New Zealand? Um, uh, it's it's over. Oh, the one thing I, f I forgot um, to mention earlier is, um, you know, the, the big thing is you've got to make sure that all the different cultures and teams feel valued and they feel like they're treated the same. So one thing that we do is um, every office. 13 public holidays in a year, you know, in New Zealand and the Philippines, they're kind of the same. Um, but what we say is team Philippines, let us know you've got 13 days of public holidays, submit to us which ones you want to recognize for the year. Same with um, uh, India uh, and the same with uh, Bangladesh. So 13 public holidays in a year, those are your valuable for your team. Your team has to go and figure out which ones that you want to recognize. We'll slot them in the calendar and then we'll celebrate um, every public holiday in our Slack water cooler channel. Um, it's really cool to see how people celebrate all the different holidays and which ones they want to recognize together. It's great. It's great. Um, from Karen Kana, what with an offshore team, what are the key roles that you keep within your New Zealand team? Uh, example, solutions architect, is that an offshore or a New Zealand role? Um, solutions architect is offshore, but it's in Australia. Uh, and it's the co-founder. Um, all of our senior engineering happens offshore. The majority of our sales team uh, is in New Zealand and operates here. So there's three of us here that are primarily doing sales. It's all still quite founder and, and CEO led. So um, I'm there in the majority of the sales meetings and calls. Um, I can add value from the CEO and the technology side and another co-founder that's based in New Zealand, Matt, is the insurance expert um, where you need to have those kind of industry conversations. And that's it. Um, um, any other questions? <laughs> We've, I know um, Paul Ilya is not feeling well. And so I think um, <laughs> she's off. Um, so I'm just going to manage this as best I can. If anyone has any other questions, ask away. Oh, a uh, quick question on, on um, oh, Grant Johnson has a question about what my weekly routine looks like as a CEO. Um, because we're a distributed team, we're operating in, in a whole bunch of different time zones. And so um, um, my mornings, 
my days can be very, very long. We have customers in the US, so you know sometimes I'm busy managing them in the morning. Um, and then the team in Australia come on later, the team in India and, and Bangladesh and the Philippines all come on in the afternoon. And they work in through the night. So I, I make sure that I carve out time for myself in the morning. Um, and so I don't start focused work until around about 10, 10.30. Um, I make sure I can drop the kids off at school, I can exercise, um, and I can do my big picture thinking, which, um, you know, when, when I'm cruising up to high altitude, um, uh, that thinking can't happen for me kind of where I am right now in front of my desk. It has to happen um, while I'm doing something else. So I actually um, do the majority of my thinking exercising in terms of high level. Um, and then I also recognize that in terms of productivity, um, uh, my bigger thinking in terms of, of creativity happens in the afternoon, uh, late afternoon, and then all my tactical stuff where I can respond to email, I can jump on to AWS and figure out some platform stuff that can happen in the mornings or, or lunchtime. Um, one thing I did, did want to mention, right, is, is um, every company needs to think about what their North Star metric is. So, um, and I talk about this, if any, quick plug, um, I do a, a weekly newsletter uh, called the top 10 in, in tech. So it's top, the number 10 in dot T-E-C-H tech. Um, and I list kind of 10 things that I read about when I'm thinking about this week that I think might be valuable to other people in the SaaS industry. Um, so if you want that in your mailbox every Friday, subscribe. Um, from the website. And so um, I write about this a lot is, you know, I talk about SAS metrics all the time and, and do kind of long handed articles about it. Um, every company will probably have a unique North Star metric that is key to them. Um, and and um, for us, what we wanted to make our, our kind of scalable North Star metric is trying to figure that out. Um, so the first thing I did was, was, was shit, man, this, this business is designed for, um, Kind of developing countries micro insurance we've got a we're targeting a new market now we've got to change pricing so the first thing i did was adjust pricing and how we price um you know because we moved to this new market we dragged along the older thinking on price so we didn't really raise prices on existing customers it doesn't really help if you're growing quickly it just makes them pissed off and unhappy um, we raised prices with our new customers um, forces us to really think about the value that we deliver with that price and how to position that. And oftentimes it makes people more, happy, more than happy. So um, the insurance industry operates on what's these books of business, which is their insurance book. Um, and, and it's written as GWP, it's gross written premium. So how much gross written premium do they have in a year? And that metric is, is an AR metric, right? Because it's how many policies did they write and how much money did that contribute in a calendar year um so it's like okay we want to tie ourselves to that um and so you get this pricing based on gwp but it doesn't help in terms of being a predictable growth because it's annual and the amount of policies they can sell in a month is really variable so on a month-on-month -month basis it doesn't give us that variable pricing um, so, so we had to introduce this minimum. So, you know, it's a, it's a minimum um, price for the insured HQ platform. Anything beyond this minimum price that you sell in terms of policies, um, we'll charge you that. And so it's the, you know, the smaller companies versus the bigger companies are going to consume more of our time and infrastructure and support. So you want to have a, a corresponding consumption price that's, that's based on that. So we are a consumption-based company now. Um, uh, which seems to work well because we're slow, because we can only grow with a handful of customers in a year. Um, what we want to do is really target a lot of our key growth through our existing customers. And so that's where we had this idea of NDR. So it's net dollar retention. Um, so designing the product in a way that has an additional benefit of allowing our customers to be customer focused means that they can increase their business, which means that we can increase our costs that we charge to them. So what, what we're looking at is, you know, we want to have 120% NDR um, on average year on year. 
Um, and so, you know, we want to grow based on customer growth, but also recognizing that we also need to grow by acquisition, right? So, so um, we still have to acquire new customers, but one of our North Star net metrics that we identified was NDR. And so once we know that, there's a whole slew of strategic things we can do underneath that that, that helps around product and people and process uh, in terms of kind of scaling that for our, our go-to model kind of scaling uh, metric. Uh, Steve Shepard asked, do, do we think we'll raise again? Um, highly possible. So, so we don't, we don't have the appetite for it right now with our um, our shareholders based on where we are as a business. Um, that can change easily in the next two years. Um, as a person that looks at the industry, I think the next two years are going to be really interesting anyway. Uh, SaaS forward multiples in terms of valuation have, you know, in 2022 just fallen off a cliff. Um, it has turned into a buyer's market very rapidly. Um, and so uh, I think deal flow will be pretty limited. Um, and I think it will be VC based. It won't be founder based anymore. Um, and so I think that's probably going to happen for the next eight, 18 to 24 months. So, so even if we wanted to raise in the next 18 to 24, I don't think the market would be the best place to raise in uh, over the next 18 to 24. So we're just going to, we're going to hold off uh, we're going to keep um, our focus on being a bootstrap business for now um, and see how the market kind of flushes out over the next year or two uh, in terms of valuations and, and kind of raising. Um, do we, uh, another question, do we plan to get back into the US? Yep, yep. Um, one of the interesting things that we had was we had one customer that is in the US um, that provides insurance um, products that are renter protection for homeowners. So as soon as COVID hit in the US, um, I don't know if anyone, it was pretty bad there in terms of people panicking and freaking out. They lost their underwriter because they just saw this market as a massive risk because people were stopping paying rent. Um, they lost their underwriter. And so since the kind of pandemic has eased off in the US, um, that business has become compelling for an underwriter to write again. They've got their underwriter back and they're starting to scale up. So we now operate within 50 states um, and we'll start marketing to that market probably um, Q3, Q4 of this year. Um, question uh, we have here is what, what was the quantum of your last raise and pre-money valuation? This all happened, uh, the last raise all happened before I came on board. Um, the multiples on ARR, I think at the time, um, this was 2020, so it was about industry standard at the time, I think it was about 7X. Um, you know, nothing like the 15 to 20X that was 2021, um, maybe more. Um, Yeah, and oh, um, so audio glitch. So what I'll do is I'll type in the um, top ten, and there we go. So that's the um, the website for the newsletter. Um, if anyone wants to read and search, there's kind of three years of newsletter um, newsletters uh, on that website, so you can search out by category. Um, and I, I think at this point we're at time. So if anyone has any questions, ask now. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Uh, I'm glad I managed to finish it off solo. Uh, but enjoy the rest of your day.